compromise basis, on a bipartisan basis, to avoid the urgent risk of a, a government shutdown. There's an urgent risk of opioid epidemic killing people in Alaska. We came together and we voted to pass that opioid uh, task or the opioid restriction bill. And we've got another urgent issue in that the hundred or the million dollars a day in cash flow credits. Uh, we could get together simply here and pass that urgent issue and address that. So those are larger issues that, that we should be focusing on. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, yesterday, uh, Representative Tarr, in her comments, uh, pointed out that the Legislative Finance Division's analysis of the House and Senate bills found an $800 million difference over by 2026 in carry forward lease expenditures or tax credits. Um, and she seemed to be pointing that as one of the reasons why the, the House is taking the position that it's taking. Um, what's your response to that difference in, in uh, numbers? Thanks, Andrew. And I think that I think we had a real good explanation yesterday by both um, our Senator Giesel and Senator Sedman talking about those carryover costs and a net tax. Those are usually incurred, and you're always uh, afforded the ability to um, take some of those uh, expenditures and write them off on your taxes. We do that in our tax code and our personal taxes. So I think that's a standard operating procedure um, for a net tax. Um, so you know, I think that you know that uh, is probably an inflated amount, and of course. Uh, what we want is we want a competitive tax regime. We want to make sure that we're not the only tax regime in net tax regime in the world that's not offering uh, a competitive uh, field for folks to operate in. So, you know, my thought is is uh, you know that that's what we have. We have a net tax system that's going to be the going forward. And it's I think it for me it's it's the issue of the taxable cashable credits right now, the million dollar credits is what we should be talking about. Um, with that, I think you probably have some good explanation on that too. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I, I'm always careful when I get estimates of things, in particularly something like a net operating loss, because a lot of things go into a net operating loss. One of the things that drives net operating loss is the price of oil. And, and you know, what, what is, what's the actual margin that you make? Another thing about net operating loss, infrastructure costs. Is it new? Is it a piece of infrastructure that they needed to build that would be approved, that could be written off as a lease expenditure? Or is it something that's normal operation? So when you get into those estimates, it's really hard to say. And as I said earlier, I can't tell you what the price of oil will be, say, seven years from now or 10 years from now or anything like that, what the development will be or what the, what the actual cost might be to do to develop something. The one thing I can tell you is that our advisor came to us. Um, uh, it was uh, Castle Rock, or not Castle Rock Outfitters. I used to work for them. Castle Gap Advisors. I'm sorry. Castle Gap Advisors came to us in the end of February, and uh, Mr. Ruggiero explained that um, he, he hasn't found another regime in the world that does not provide people to recover their costs. And um, for that matter, the Internal Revenue Service allowed me to, re to write off costs and recover costs when I was in business for myself. So in a net tax system, that's certainly not unusual. So in order for us to compete, and, and it's a competition, you know, the oil industry, we're all aware of all the different places that produce oil and all the different things that happen. In order for us to, to stay at least even with everyone else we have to we I, I honestly believe that we have to have some of the same provisions other people do to attract investment and attract people to produce so the net operating losses the ability for people to recover their costs is not certainly not unusual anywhere I think it's it's kind of critical for us to do that and um, another recommendation that he had made was to, uh, he, he had suggested that we would allow people if we, if we change our structure, that we would allow people to carry the net operating losses forward until they get into a production mode, which is what a provision that we have in there. So it's not just uh, we're going to pay out a bunch of cash early before you produce oil. We're, 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 coming, we're trying to come to a point where you own a piece of property, you go into production, and that's when your net operating losses can be applied. Um, that, that seems to be fairly common in a lot of places. So I, I think uh, um, putting a, a definite number on things is very difficult to do. Um, I, have, I don't have experience, as much experience as a legislator as many of my uh, colleagues here. 
but I do have a lot of municipal experience, and I, I remember that it's just very difficult to look out there and say, well, it's going to be this because we think it's going to be this, or it's going to be this because we think it's going to be this. The one thing that we do know is that people are allowed to recover their costs in other places, and um, in order for us to really stay in the game, I think that's critical for us to do that as well. And I think, you know, the point about the no deduction without pr production on those net operating losses is very important. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to continue the trend that's been started. We've gained uh, production, which hasn't happened in a long time. Two years in a row we've gained production. So we know we've got some things right. Uh, we want to continue down that path. Our goal is to get 5% next year, 5% more production, 10%. Those are goals that we want to achieve. And tax policy has a lot to do with getting production, the increases that we need. So, I, I mean, I think it's really important. Anybody else? Go ahead. I just want to say that, that I'm excited that we, we uh, we've had an agreement on forming a working group and um, having our three consultants come in. I mean, this isn't a one-shot deal. I mean, we, we, this, this doesn't, like, like my colleague said, this uh, will change. Uh, uh, world economics will change. Oil economics will change. This isn't a one-shot deal. We've agreed to a working group. We can continue this discussion. Um, this isn't something we're saying we're going to shut this down after this vote. This is a the, part of this compromise that the Senate has, has came came to the table with is a working group and I think that 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 just makes sense and so I I, I just wanted to uh, throw that in there so I think a, a real positive step uh, as far as working together in our compromise James James Brooks from the Juno Empire you had said that an agreement is possible but in your view is it likely Hmm. Anything's anything's possible, and I, I believe it's likely. I think uh, yesterday's conference committee, where you saw both um, Chair Tar and Chair Giesel talk about what they had on the table, um, I'm comfortable. Uh, Senator Giesel has indicated that her and Representative Tar are still talking, even as early as last night. They were talking about the next step forward. So yeah, I I am. I am ever optimistic, and I think that this is something that Alaskans really are demanding us to do uh, and take care of. And I think you saw that yesterday when you saw all the folks that were engaged that are dependent on having a vibrant oil economy in the state of Alaska. They came out and to show force that they are here, they are listening, and they want us to move forward uh, on something that is workable for the whole state. When you have folks that are engaged, that are taking off at 3 in the afternoon to show up down at the LIO to say, you know, we need a stable, competitive fiscal climate, um, I, think, I, think it's, I think I'm optimistic. I think that was, you know, the message that I got yesterday was we might not agree on everything, but there's a, there's a set of things, 35 out of 40, um, we're incredibly close. It could happen, and I, I'm going to remain optimistic, and again, I'm inviting the House Democrats to join us in Juno, continue down the path of, of meeting, uh, if it has to be hourly, meeting hourly on what we're supposed to be doing, what's on the call. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Could I, could I add that uh, uh, success in policymaking doesn't lie in having everything you want all in one package. Uh, you, you guys have watched politics for a long time. A success in policymaking is an incremental process. And achieving an end of taxable credits would be a significant policy change, which even the Department of Revenue's white paper acknowledged. They said that um, it's uh, not something to resist doing out of a belief that there's more to be had in the future, and that credit reform is a substantial progress and a major transformative event for the state in its relationship to the industry. Um, I have every confidence that Representative Tarr would uh, be appreciative of the chance to notch that significant policy win and uh, put that in their pocket and continue to work forward as they have wanted to do to the next uh, stage of reform. And it's, so we've seen again what we can get done when there's a will and there's goodwill on this side, and we trust there is on the minority, a majority side, and I've got confidence that we can get this done by the end of special session. I did have a follow-up question that you had just brought up. You had said that um, a first step towards a larger goal, and how much of the divide disagreement right now is because there's something else out there, and that this isn't just a debate about oil and gas and and what's on the table right now. There's also something larger out there. Yeah, I, I think I think there's um, I think that's part of it, and you know, unfortunately, we can only deal with what's in two versions of the bill. Uh, so you've got the conference committee that can, can can decide between the two options and and throwing something out there. I think it was a little distracting. I think uh, Senator Kelly said, you know, it was unexpected, and it is, but unexpected as it was, we still have a path forward. 
there's still opportunity in that. We can have that conversation about NOLs, and I think we should. We should continue to talk about tax policy because the end goal for all of us is to have a competitive tax regime and tax policy that makes sure that we have increased production. I mean, this end goal for all of us, 90% uh, of our budget just depends on oil production. So the more oil in the pipe, the better Alaskan sits financially. So our goal through all this process, and it always been, I mean, I've been here nine years. I know Representative Schultz and Steve, Representative Thompson have been working on this. Their whole legislative career is finding that perfect spot where we can be competitive and still maintain a good uh, future for oil production in the state of Alaska. And I think you've seen that. I mean, we've had increases in oil production for the last two years. I mean, we're doing something right. So we continue to do that and work towards that goal. Um, you know, fiscal stability and tax stability for any company is vital. It's vitally important. So what we need to focus on now is the differences in those two bills. We can have the NOL discussion. We have a working group, like Representative Johnson said. We're, we, you know, we have the, we have, well, we always have a, a oil bill in front of us. So that, I mean, no, if we do this, the, no one thinks that oil tax discussions are going to go away. They're going to continue because they always will continue. It's an ever evolving, you know, fiscal puzzle that we put together. So, I think, um, got to keep moving. Can I, can I go ahead, Delina? Delina. Wait, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, one of the things that gives me some, you know, gives me some hope, and again, I'm an optimist as well, but the governor, the governor is solidly wants to see this pass. This is something that the governor wants to see done. And so um, I think we're all working, I think we all have the same, same goal in mind. I mean, um, knowing it's an economic issue where you're adding $200 million a day of additional um, cash credit obligation. I mean, that, that, that doesn't, change if no matter what camp you're in we all recognize the economic impact that not doing something with casual credits and so it just you know i mean it just comes down to making sense that something needs to get done so i would think we're all on the same page with that uh, frankly james there, there are fiscal benefits to both sides if you want to you know, look at it through a political lens which is i think the question you're asking uh, the ability to retain a million dollars a day in the state treasury to do things that democrats the majority wants to do and to provide the stability and uh, confidence the oil industry needs to produce the oil that they discovered with these credits i think there's a, a clear fiscal win for both sides and i hope the politics and the fiscal policy align to, to lead us to success Liz Rains with KTVA again. Uh, the conference committee is tasked with working out the differences between the versions passed by the House and the Senate, but yesterday the House brought up an element uh, with a net operating loss policy that wasn't found in either of those versions, and that raised some questions about whether or not that would mean a new conference committee would have to be appointed if uh, lawmakers were to take up that issue. Has there been any clarity at this point as to how that would work and how that might shift the time frame in meeting Saturday's deadline? I think you've seen that the the, um, the legislature is nimble in that it can waive uniform rules and it can make exceptions when there's two thirds of agreement. And I think you know for us uh, um, and for our caucus is something that that we have to do structurally on a uniform rule basis to get us to a point where we can pass a bill by midnight on Saturday. I think you'll see a group of us that in our caucus that are willing to do it. Our whole caucus probably just to see that we can protect Alaska's economy and, and take that million dollars a day and stop that credit that we're putting out there. Um, I, I think they're well, nimble, nimble enough to do that. I think, um, I think you know, Representative Schnault can probably talk about some of the times that he's had to be nimble and work with the minority and the majority to get to a place where you can move quickly. Um, but I think, again, seeing that compromise between the two bills is what, you know, we see most agreement on. So we'd like to stay within those boundaries to do that. Again, we go back to the, the working group.